Houston Dynamo, Portland Timbers, Sporting Kansas, Los Angeles Galaxy, Beach Pass, Toronto FC, Salt Lake, Chicago Fire, Columbus Crew, FC Dallas, New York Red Bulls, Pitch Pass, your all-access credential to the people that matter in MLS. Here's your host, Greg Roach. Hello, welcome to another edition of Pitch Pass. Uh, if you have not downloaded last week's episode, please do that. It was a fantastic and a very candid conversation with Aleko Eskandarian, a former MLS star and now current New York Cosmos uh, assistant coach. It was really, really, really interesting and um, just getting his thoughts on his day to day life and how he manages based on the injury that forced him from the sport is just really compelling self. So make sure you go to pitchpass.com and uh, download that episode. But thank you for downloading this episode as well. And by the way, when you're at pitchpass.com, we've got a new feature up there. A couple of uh, MLS uh, experts, insiders, if you will. I don't want to say either because I'm on the list well and I'm neither an insider nor an expert. But we started putting together our list of 23 that we think will be next year uh, playing for the United States in Brazil for the uh, 2014 World Cup. So check them out. See what uh, seems interesting to you. Some uh, some people whose list look a little out of whack. <coughs> me and uh, some surprises that you may see i know i put one definite surprise on there so uh, pitchpass.com if you want to check that out Um, a man who did not contribute to our list and i understand why he's got a very successful website on his own he doesn't need to do other things with other people especially uh little websites like ours i'm talking about ivis galarsip he will join us later on the show to uh, go around mls and maybe talk about some gold cup stuff as well Uh, but first we head to Kansas City. Sporting Kansas City's right back extraordinaire Chance Myers joins us right now. Chance, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm good. Well, I'm I'm not as good as you because I hear you're actually out the door on your way to a to a ball game, which sounds to me like something that I'd rather be doing than sitting here at work. Um, but you are on your way to a Royals game, correct? Yeah, in a minute. I'm about to go pick up my parents and uh, head out to the ballpark. Oh, nice, it's nice night tonight. It's a family night. It is. Now, are they in town or or what's the story? Yeah, they. Uh, it was my mom's birthday this past weekend, so her, my dad, and my sister, and a couple other family members flew into the game this weekend, and it just so happened we had a game Wednesday as well, so they stayed. Yeah, you can knock you can knock two games out, and then also catch some baseball. Who are they playing tonight? I think Cleveland, so it's a divisional rivalry. It'll be good. <laughs> Look at you! You're it's like you, you it's like you are born and raised in Kansas City. Now you're talking about division rivals. I almost thought you were going to say we have a big game tonight against the Indians. Yeah, I'm actually a Dodgers fan. I'm a Dodgers <laughs> fan, but I know my baseball, I guess. Yeah, and you can also you can also say, well, that's my National League team, and I, I have the Royals as my American League team, and not not upset anybody. Yeah, there you, I guess I can say that. Oh, not you the Angels. Okay, all right. It doesn't sound like you want to actually commit to the Royals yet. You still you still Dodger blue. I still back them, though, because they're my hometown team right now. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. I wanted to ask you about the team and and the the town that you're living in right now and and you were there uh when the when the Sporting Kansas City was still the Wizards what what changed i know it was a rebrand i know that you guys got a new stadium but where were these fans at uh pre 2011 and and what kind of changed it from a a an okay soccer town to an amazing soccer town you know what? It's it's kind of like one of those things you wake up and it's totally different the next day. Once we uh, we rebranded, you know, the owners changed it, Sporting Kansas City, and they they built this stadium. I think it just built so much hype that everybody wanted to know a little bit about you know what's going on. It once they came out to a game, it just evolved from there. It just people brought their friends, and those friends came back and brought their friends, and it just you know it's a trickle effect, and more and more people started coming out. And now I think. Tomorrow night, we're sold out for the 26th game in a row. So that's, I don't know. It's just playing a cab. You know, that was our old ballpark we played in. It was a minor league baseball ballpark. We we would sell out sometimes, not all the time. And fans were, you know, pushed probably 50, 60 yards away from us because of the way the baseball diamond was, you know, centered. Um, so it wasn't maybe a fun fanfare event for some fans until they came to Sporting Park and, you know, they're right on the sidelines. doesn't matter where you sit. So I think just the transformation and the excitement that the stadium and the, the rebranding built is kind of what, you know, saw all our fans finally commit and, you know, join us. 
Now you're I know you're a music fan. So is there are there sporting snobs who who now look at people post 2011 and say to themselves, well, you know, I I was a big I was a big Kansas City Wizards fan back in 20 in 2003. Um now I'll take them. I don't it doesn't matter to me <laughs> as long as they're supportive. I know you'll take them, but are there the the Kansas City Wizards snobs like the music snobs who who always like to know, hey, I, you know, I was a fan of that band uh, back back 2 years ago when nobody else knew who they were. Right. Um you know, I kind of I guess stay out of that. I don't really hear too much <laughs> about it, but you know, the more events we have going around town, like when the US games playing, they're they're throwing they're hosting parties, you know, watch parties and they like to have us come down there and watch it with them so we can cheer on our boys like Zeus and Bees. So it's fun to see events like that, you know, created from our own fan base. I wanted to talk to you about uh well the 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 ease that it must be whipping in crosses to Claudio, knowing that you know I, I just I get in the vicinity and and he'll do something with it. How freeing is that for you as as a wide person who whips in crosses? Yeah, the guy's touch is ridiculous <laughs> around the box. He uh he's a I don't know finisher. You know he does things that we all wish we could do around the box. You know maybe. His strength isn't speed, getting in behind defenses, but you know once we build up, we have the ability to build up and send crosses in or cut balls back to him, he's, he's going to put it on target nine out of ten times. And eight of those ten times probably going to go in just because of how you know clinically he is around the, around the goal. And then sometimes when Kai's on the other side, whipping the ball to him too is easy. <laughs> But and and is it a situation where you think to yourself, you know, maybe I probably wouldn't get a cross in or put it in at this exact moment, but I know that Claudio is there, so uh, I'm more apt to to send more balls into the box than I would if somebody else with maybe a little less touch around the box is there. Yeah, I think with Claudio, you know, you want to find his feet because he can score left and right, clinical. He he can score this head as well, but if you can keep the ball on the ground and just find a spot or a pocket for Claudio to, to find as well and meet, he's, it's just, it's easy for him. And that's, that's kind of what we, we practice. Did you know that from the first time that he started practicing? Cause I know he came in, he hadn't played in a while. He had some rust to shake off, but did you see the qualities there? And you just thought to yourself, you know, when he gets his, when he's to full fitness, look out guys. Yeah. I mean, when we would do finishing drills and crossing and stuff after practice on our own, he can tag a ball and to see something like that and to know he's on your team, and you know, you know, his qualities, as long as he knows our qualities and where to be and where to show up, it's helped. And, and I think a lot of his finishes, he's just flowing and he finds those pockets and he knows where the ball's going to be. And, you know, we do our best to find them as well, but he, he makes our job easier for sure. And uh, I'll 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 use the the polite word and say he's very crafty uh, when he's uh, playing against defenders. And uh, are you can you read between the lines on the crafty line, Chance? Yeah, <laughs> I mean he makes it. I mean he makes it hell for defenders. You know, it's, they it's chippy. He you know he most defenders should find a way to do that to him. But he's he's on the offense and he's he's picking little you know little fights. You know he's he's catching the guys off guard. So they're thinking about him what he's going to do instead of you know, what he's really doing and his movements and stuff like that. And it's a it's a mark of, of how he can get under defender skin. I mean, he got Nesta sent off, which you think about it, think about the guys that or, or what he has had to put up with over his illustrious career and for, for Claudio to be able to actually get under his skin. That that's actually says a lot about how chippy he is. Right. And he does that every game. And it's, <laughs> it's funny to watch sometimes. Sometimes it gets him in trouble too, but, you know, it's, it's tough for the defender to deal with that kind of stuff, and it takes your focus away from the buildup of the game and everything else. So it, it's 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 new to me to see that kind of thing because I haven't really been around it, but I see it and I and I appreciate how he can, you know, create this, you know, this weird thing where he's drawing the defense, he's drawing one player away, which opens up another player because he's so focused on you know what's Claudio doing to him, you know. Yeah. Let's talk. Funny. Let's talk a little bit about music. Um, you are the uh, the DJ of of the locker room. I am a radio DJ, so I, I feel like we can talk music peer to peer almost. Okay. Um, I, I noticed that you are a Spotify fan over Pandora. What what goes into that thing? I have a theory, but I want to ask you what why you think that way first. Because 
I can pick which songs I want to listen to. <laughs> it's exact, and and I like that because it's it's subtle. But you're basically saying I don't need Pandora to show me the music. I already know the music right. that everybody wants to hear. Right, and we have a lot of DJs and stuff on the team. It's you know whoever wants to hear whatever they'll throw their iPod on there. But you know, in preseason we're in vans and we're listening to music nonstop. So it's fun to have a playlist of no commercials and not playing. But here's what I like about you. Uh, at least from what I've read, you've, your musical diversity is is really impressive. And you know, when po- when people plug in their iPods, the problem with that is you get a lot of times if if one person plugs their iPod in, you're getting one brand of music. But based on your list of of artists that you're digging these days, you're all across the spectrum, which leads me to believe that I want to hear your playlist more than somebody else's iPhone plugged in. If you like country, I'm not your guy, but everything else, <laughs> I'll I'll pretty much cover it. <laughs> Are you? Uh, do you listen to the? Because you have a really good alternative station in Kansas City. Do you listen to the radio, or are you getting all of your music from Spotify in their their suggestion list? No, no, I do. I listen to ninety six five, the Buzz. It's yeah. mostly all alternative stuff, and then every day at twelve, it's all nineties music. So it takes me back a little bit, but it's it's a really good radio station. I enjoy that one the most. If I'm not, you know, listening to Spotify. And then, how do you find your your top forty and your your hip hop? Um. I kind of pick those off spot if I got like my buddies that I follow from back home or stuff like that. They'll always come up with new stuff and they're always, you know, around music more than I am being from LA and everything. So they're going to new shows and finding out new artists and posting on their, whatever their Facebook or their Twitter and stuff. And are you pulling from like, say, say Kai's got a song on there that you haven't heard before. Are you going up and asking him, Hey, what, what is that? And then go getting in it for yourself. Yeah, or I'll try to listen to the lyrics and plug in what I think the title <laughs> of the song is. Uh, give me some of the names of the playlists that you have that are, are for the guys on the team. Like, what do you call them? Um, shoot, I gotta open it up. Let me put you in the speaker. Real yeah, quick. go ahead. Let's, because I want to. I want it. Like, is there is there a pre match uh, hype mix? Is there a post match victory party mix? What what are, what are these called? Um. I feel like most of the players I'll throw together. I'll just get a title out there quick, and it's basically where we're at, where we're going, who we're playing. Um, or like when I went, when we were in Philly, like I would look up something like whatever, whatever the name of the town we're staying at. If there's like a historical place there, I'll just like type that like Bowman's Hill. Like there's this cool yeah. little park there that I like to always visit. I'll, I'll throw that as a title. Um, I don't know. Here, we're in preseason. Yeah. I play this with Tucson Beats. Yeah, nothing specific, really. Here's what I want you to do, Chance. And again, this is this is one professional to another professional. It's, as you start getting your road trips together, I know you guys have uh, Chicago coming up. Start working in Chicago artists into the Chicago playlist. Just to, just to go, For okay, sure. now we know where we're going. I want I want some guys talking about Chicago. Yeah, and I'm I'm a guy too. Like when we'll go visit, I'll look for shows that are playing oh, nice. after the game or the next day. And if if it's a good show and it's worth staying, I'll I'll try to stay an extra day because we're off the next day. Yeah, and try to stay and go to the show. Really cool. So the, and then that's you're kind of walking around the city and getting to know the vibe of the city by checking out their music venues. I like that. For sure. After the, well, you lost Roger Espinosa in the offseason. Kai wasn't there, and it was kind of touch and go about whether he would come back. You were trying to integrate Claudio in. So I would imagine for you guys, the first uh, few weeks, month of the season were a bit of a transition. Are you guys where you want to be uh, after the changes that you guys made in the offseason? Yeah, and I was thinking about this today. If you go back and look at all of our games, Every one of our games, we could have we could have won. Yeah. You know, we're in every game. We're not going into a place and, you know, coming out of there like, dang, we got we got school today. We got work. We're putting in an effort. We're making it hard for every team to play against us. And that's something I think that's in our DNA. You know, our TV, our coaches instill that into us. So every time we step on the field, you know, we make it difficult for teams to play. Make them beat us. And if you look at some of the results, we made it easy for teams by our mistakes to beat us, like the Toronto game. Or you go back to this game we played the last weekend, we gave Columbus two goals, you know? Yeah. And so that's something, if we can act that, you know, we're, I, I feel like we're one of the toughest teams to play against. But, uh, you know, speaking of Ty being gone, coming back, you know, not knowing if he's going to come back, you lose that aerial presence, you know? 
but we have guys that, you know, Zeus can fill out, out wide. Jacob Peterson was coming back healthy. He, he puts in a tough shift every time he's out on the field, and he's creating havoc for defenders. You know, we have so many guys that can create something different from Kai, but help nonetheless. And then when you integrate Kai back in, and those guys then have the confidence of, of the run out when he was gone, now you're looking at a, a formidable offensive team. Exactly. And now you speak of Dom. You know, he went yeah. down to USL, scored 15 goals. We brought him back. Mm-hmm. He's playing with more confidence than maybe anybody else on our team, and that's huge for us. We need that. I've been a big fan of, of SUNY for for a while, and I'm kind of just waiting for him to break out in MLS. Um, and it's it, I think it's just going to come down to him getting a, a chance to play consistent minutes, which in, in your team is going to be difficult. But how close is he to, to really introducing himself to uh, to the United States in MLS? I uh, very similar. And I take it back to how I kind of broke in. It took me three years to yeah. consistently, you know, finally start playing. And whether it's an injury, whether it's whatever it is, once you get your chance to play and perform, it's huge. And I think SUNY did that against Columbus. And I, I hope he gets a chance Wednesday to do it too, you know, not knowing what line going to be. But he has so much potential. It's, it's kind of ridiculous how, how high the ceiling is for him, I think. You know, he's, He's just getting called into his national team and yeah. performing well there. So he's bringing that confidence back here. And, you know, every day in practice, he's scoring some ridiculous goals for us. Last thing, and this is about one of your teammates, uh, just because you're, you're there and you're seeing him. Where, where are, where's Teal at in his recovery? He's there. You know, he's fast as ever, fast as he was. He was by far the fastest guy on our team. So, you know, once he's, Fully fit, fully back to 90 minutes straight. You know we're gonna welcome that back with open arms because he's he's a difference maker. And it's gonna help because if we play certain defenses where we need somebody who can open up top, we can maybe play two fours. You know, mm-hmm. Claudio Antio up there. So it's it's gonna be exciting once he's back to full fitness. I'm gonna let you get going because I know you got the fam and you got to go to the game. So enjoy the baseball, Chance, and thanks for joining us on the show. Anytime, man. That's Chance Myers. And I don't. I hope we didn't go too in depth, and you know, two two music professionals just talking. And I hope we didn't go over your head. Of course, I'm kidding. You love music as much as everybody else does. Let's uh, talk to another big music fan. But he, he leans more hip hop. At least that's what I gather based on his tweets. Uh, soccer at soccer by Ivis is his Twitter handle. Uh, soccer by Ivis dot net is his website. You know all about that. And now he's got a podcast that's competing against ours. Thanks for nothing, Ivis. We welcome Ivis Galarsa to the show and I was am, am I, what I was I speaking out of turn there are you a hip hop above all other types of music fan uh yeah I'd say so hip hop uh, I like dance music house music where do you stand with EDM well yeah that, I, mean, I, I listen to EDM actually got it so that's your that's your wheelhouse currently Okay, all right, because we, we we did a lot of music talk with uh, with Chance Myers, who was on before uh, you were, and uh, we were talking about his playlist that he puts together. So if you were having some sort of, of match, game match, EDM would be your... Uh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I think I'd probably go, I'd probably go a little old school hip-hop, a little uh, Mob Deep and uh, Wu-Tang Clan. Maybe. I like that. I, go, nothing wrong with the classics, Ivis. Nothing wrong with the classics. Uh, I'm all about I'm all about the old school uh, old school hip hop. I have to I had to uh, I had to tweak you a little bit. You you you've launched a podcast. You couldn't give us at least the podcast world. You've got Twitter locked down. You've got the the website locked down, and now you're taking <laughs> podcasting away from us, Ivis. Well, you guys have about 300 plus episodes, so it's going to take me a while to catch you guys. <laughs> all right, okay, all right, but you're trying your best, and I, I like that. So uh, it's it's all at soccerbyivis.net, correct? Everything, the blog yeah. as well as the podcast, right. correct? Cool, cool. So, so let's get into some some talk first. Um, and before we get into MLS stuff, I, I do want to get a couple of your your overview thoughts on on Gold Cup. So let's start there. Um, I want to ask you about Jack Mack and if we are putting too much stock in him being on the Gold Cup roster. I mean, he he still is. He's he's twenty twenty one years old. Um, I don't think I don't think it's fair to think that he could go play in Gold Cup and then automatically walk onto the roster that could make the World Cup for next year. Am I wrong in thinking that? Uh, I think they'd be rushing it a little. I don't think that's the plan. I don't think Klinsman, Jurgen Klinsman called him in with that idea in mind. I think that you know, I think you know, just based on what I know, uh, the sense I get is Klinsman is completely understanding of the fact that 
you know, it's easy to forget Jack McInerney is only 20 years old. Yeah. Right. I, I think I think that kind of gets lost in all this with all the goals that he scored and everything. He's still a young player, and you know, he he doesn't have that experience on the national team level, uh, and he hasn't actually had that experience on the even on the the older youth national team level. So, this is a new experience for him, and I think you know, knowing Klinsman and knowing obviously as a legendary forward that he was, I think he understands that he wants to bring him along slowly. If anything, you know, American soccer has burned through too many young talents in the past, and you don't want to rush someone along too fast. So I don't, I don't know anyone that thinks he's going to step in and start in the Gold Cup right away and be the star for the Gold Cup. I think that's a little ambitious. I think what he wants, to, what Klinsman wants to do is bring him in and have him kind of, you know, get acclimated and, and see what it's like playing on that level and training on that level and being around uh, teammates, uh, you know, who who are at that higher level. So I think people should take it slow. I think uh, best case for me, I think best case scenario is him coming on on as a sub in a few games and maybe later in the tournament uh, he can play some kind of role. But I, I don't know if he's going to be a starter. So from a guy who who's a little too soon to maybe a guy that is a little too late, um, uh, Aguchi Anyewu. Look, I'd rather be him than Carlos Bocanegra, but what is he going to have to do in Gold Cup to reestablish that he is at least on the fringes of the national team setup, the full team setup? I just think he needs to play well. And I, the thing is, right, it, it, it'd be one thing if he has spent the last few years playing terribly. He just hasn't played at all, right? I mean, he, he played in Portugal, and he actually played well there uh, when he was healthy. Um, but since he made the move to Spain, obviously that, that really – Turned into a bit of a dud. I mean, I'm sure he, I'm sure he made a ton of money uh, making the move, but it, it, you know, it really hurt him from a playing standpoint. Uh, I think, I think anyone who's written him off already has probably been a little premature because it, it's one thing if you're, you know, in MLS and you're not playing, or if you're in the English second division and not playing, that's one thing. But if you're on the bench at Malaga, who you know was a Champions League team, they were in the knockout rounds of the Champions League this past year. That's not exactly, uh, you know, chop liver. So it, 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 people should kind of look at that, and, and and before they just assume that he's washed up, that he doesn't have anything left. I think the problem is for some people is they, they still have the visions of him struggling through national team games. Clearly not 100 uh, percent, even just a year ago. Obviously in in those games uh, last summer uh, where he got a chance to play and he just didn't look good. Uh, he wasn't right. Something was, something was up with the knees, and 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 it, it cost him. So I, I think as long as he shows. Number one, that he's healthy, and number two, that he still has the the physical traits to be a dominant center back. I think he can absolutely play himself right back into the full team conversation. And and if he can play at at a high at a level, you know, close to his pre injury level, I mean, he's going to be right there. He's he's right there being a top four center back, in my opinion. We've got some preliminary World Cup 2014 U.S. roster, 23-man roster, posted right now at PitchPass.com. Um, when I was putting that list together, uh, the three guys who are on the Gold Cup roster are probably the three guys that I was thinking about for the third keeper role, which, you know, isn't the biggest uh, spot, but it's still a spot, and you still get to go to Brazil, and you still are on a World Cup roster, and no one can take that away from you. I actually chose Ramondo over Hamid and over Sean Johnson and over Tally Hall because I thought to myself— in that position, you'd want a veteran guy, so if worst-case scenario, something happens, you know you have confidence in that guy, and leave the whole, well, who is the heir apparent to to Tim Howard and Brad Guzan's backup for after the World Cup? Do you agree with that, and will we have any clues as to where Jurgen Klinsmann is thinking about for third keeper for, for Brazil uh, in who he chooses for Gold Cup? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I, would, I would put all sorts of money on uh, Nick Ramon of being the third goalkeeper for the World Cup, if he's healthy. Uh, and it, it's not just about him being a veteran. Uh, it's also that he's a really good locker room guy. And he's a guy who, you know, you want someone who's ready to, sit, to step in there, accept and embrace that third goalkeeper role, and, and bring something positive to the locker room. And and that's not to say that, you know, guys like Bill Hamid and Sean Johnson would be necessarily bad locker room guys. But, you know, Romano's been around. You know, he's... He, he has those bonds with, with the guys on the team. He, he's been around the team enough and around these guys, you know, different players in the pool enough that, you know, there's that respect factor. And, and I think he'd feel pretty comfortable in that role. And, you know, the fact that you have Tim Howard and Brad Guzan as your number one and your number two, um, you know, I, I think you can kind of 
even if, let's say, for example, Sean Johnson, Bill Hamid, let's say one of them, or both of them even, over the course of the next year just starts to dominate and we play really well. Um, maybe in that scenario, you could even have a much better argument for those guys. But even then, I still would say, since you know you have your top two guys, those are the unquestioned top two guys, you can sacrifice, I don't want to use the word sacrifice, but you can use that third goalkeeper spot on someone who's going to help create a, a good overall team atmosphere in, in the locker room and in a camp. Especially, you know, when you talk about the World Cup, you're, you know, they're in camp for weeks at a time you, before they leave and then when they get to the country that the World Cup's in. And uh, Jurgen Klinsmann, you know, talking to him actually in Washington a while back, you know, he talked about how important that is. Uh, in, uh, you know, his, his big mantra is, is, is how important it is to have players who are givers and not just having players who are takers. And, he, you know, Romando fits in that category yeah. as someone who's a giver. He's someone who just, you know, he, he'll support teammates. He's a, kind of a rah-rah guy. He, he, he looks, the, you know, if a guy's down, he'll, he'll put his arm around his shoulder. So th- those are the things that are in his favor because, you know, and obviously with experience and he's been around so long. And, and aside from all that, he's still a good goalkeeper. I mean, totally. he was, for, you know, he was my pick for goalkeeper. He was on my, uh, on our SBI best 11 for this past week. I mean, he's posted another shutout. For me, he's probably going to start in the Gold Cup. So he's still playing at a high level. Uh, but I think even if, let's say, the age starts to catch up with him over the next year, I still think even then you can take that chance just because of what he can, the intangibles that he can bring. Okay, so you just kind of said what well, you said, that you think that you think he's going to be the starter for Gold Cup. But uh, does does Jurgen Klinsmann need to see him on an international level in a competition like this? Or do you say, all right, look, Nick's my guy for, for next year. But this year, for this competition, I want to see what one of these two young guys, how they handle the pressure of an international tournament. Uh, I, you know, the thing is this. He already wants to win it. You know, it's not a – this Gold Cup is not just some, you know – competition that doesn't really matter i mean it really matters uh i mean obviously it always matters but like i really get the sense that they see this as a chance to win this tournament back obviously the last two gold cups have been a nightmare in terms of losing in the in the finals in ugly fashion to mexico that jürgen Klinsmann definitely does not want that so i think he wants to put the best guy the guy he feels he can trust the most between the pipes and let's face it uh, you know, Sean Johnson, Bill Amit, you know, neither one of them has his uh, Romano's experience on the club level or even on the international level. Yeah. Romano has his share of caps. He's played well for the U.S. team and before. So I don't, I just don't think he's going to be rattled in that situation. And, and that's why I think when it comes down to it, when you get to the important games, I just think he's the guy. Yeah, I think he's still at a high enough level that you play him. Now, will there be opportunities for those other guys down the road? I'm, I'm sure there will be, but I, I don't think now, I don't think there's this, I really don't think there's an urgency to test those guys on the international level yet. I think, uh, you know, you bring them in, you have them train, you have them work with Chris Woods when you get a chance every camp here and there. But as far as getting them games internationally, I, you know, I don't think this Gold Cup's the tournament. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And as I said in, in our on our recap on PitchPass.com, to me, that's an argument for late 2014, 2015 is who's going to be Brad Guzan's backup. So why address it this year or next year when you don't have well, to? I, right. Well, I'll tell you what, a perfect example of a game where, you know, when you want to talk about games potentially to give those guys, I tell you what, if the U.S. takes care of business in September, right, let's say they get a result in Costa Rica, they beat Mexico, uh, and they pretty much lock up a World Cup spot in September, then all of a sudden you have two games in October. Perfect game yeah. for M- for for guys like Bill Hamid and Sean Johnson to play it. Uh, when you talk about Jamaica in Kansas City and then the game at Panama, I mean, those are perfect. Those are the perfect opportunities. Because, listen, you're not going to have Brad Duzan uh, fly in the middle of his Premier League season. You're not going to have him fly back for – basically meaningless games that they don't even need, right? So you're not going to have that. You're not going to bring – you're obviously not bringing Tim Howard in when you've already qualified. So I think those games would be perfect for the young guys to, to get get opportunities to start. So I'd say if those things play out, I think if you have – you know, if you can get a tie or a win in Costa Rica and you get a win against – a tie or a win against Mexico, you get your four points, you lock up your World Cup spot, then it comes down to, okay, who's playing better in MLS, Sean Johnson or Bill Hamid? And I think then is when you'll see those guys get a chance. So let's tra- start to transition over to MLS and um, putting Landon Donovan aside because I have something to ask you about him uh, next. Who's going to miss their Gold Cup players more? Is it Jack Mack with, with, with Philadelphia Union or the three guys from Real Salt Lake? 
Oh, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, I'd say what Philly relies on McInerney so much. Yeah. I mean, he's so important. Not just the goals that he scores, but the runs that he makes to create space for his teammates and and can and draw defend, draw defenders away from his teammates. I, I think that's going to be a tough one for Philly because they don't, you know, they don't really have anyone who can replace him. I, I, I know they can move Latou to forward and play Connor, Casey, and Latou up top. That's an option as well that they could go with. But I think, you know, we also think of anything they've shown this year that they can they can play without top guys and, and, and not miss a beat. You know what I mean? I mean, I know, obviously, you know, Nick Romando, that's you know, nothing against Sean Saunders, but it's a, it's a big drop-off there. Um, and obviously, Beckerman, you're going to miss Beckerman. But uh, I think they've shown that their bench yeah. is pretty solid. So I, I think from that standpoint, they'll be all right. Philly's the one where they're still a young team, they're still a work in progress. They don't really have great depth, I'd say. So that I, I think Philly could could end up missing him. Totally agree. More. And and uh, the reason I put Landon and Donovan aside because I look at the attacking options, especially now with, with Villarreal coming back from from the under twenties, and I think to myself, okay, look, it's Landon Donovan, and yes, they will miss a player of that caliber, but. I don't think it's 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 a gut punch as say Jack Mack off of a Philadelphia Union. Are the Galaxy going to be all right without Landon Donovan for a month? I think they'll be okay. I mean, they still. I mean, let's face it; they still have Robbie Keane. Yeah. You take McInerney off of Philly, and all of a sudden you're looking around and saying, "Okay, who's our star attacking player?" You really don't have one. I mean, look who. He's doing well on the assist front, but I don't think he's a dominant force that he was a couple of years ago. Robbie Keane is still a guy who could just do so much. I mean, it, it, it's kind of it was overshadowed in the in the San Jose loss because of the comeback that San Jose pulled off. But I tell you what, Robbie Keane, you can argue had the best game of anyone of the weekend because of I mean as many chances as he created. I mean, he had two assists. He could have had five or six. He is just so tough to deal with, and and I think from that standpoint. You know, as long as you still have him there, uh, I think they have enough other pieces around him. Uh, when you talk about the rookie, Josh Zardes, youngster Villarreal, uh, Robbie Rogers, who I think is starting to maybe settle in now and, and, and show what he can do. I think there's enough, there are enough pieces around there for, for Robbie Keane to still lead that attack. Well, uh, red flag at all, warning sign, worry spot that they did cough up that lead that they, they had, that they didn't lock it down. And, this, I mean, this isn't a young team, or it, it, they have veterans to settle down the younger players on the team. Um, I guess what I'm leading up to is I just don't know if you can win an MLS Cup with Carlo Cudicini, uh as your keeper. Same thing with, with Red Bulls. I don't know if you can do it with Robles either. Well, I, you know, I'll tell you what. The Galaxy won two titles with Josh Saunders in, in gold, <laughs> and I, I, never, I have never considered him exactly a world beater. So... It, they're not losing games lately. They haven't been blow, blowing leads and, and costing themselves points because of the attack necessarily lately. I feel like their defense is making yeah. just uncharacteristic mistakes and having breakdowns. I mean, Omar Gonzalez, I mean, I, I, I tell you what, i got to make a list. I don't know how many games now uh, between the national team and the Galaxy where he's just flat out cost his team games by having mental breakdowns. And this this past game was another example. I mean, who's the guy that's caught in no man's land on Alan Gordon's game winner? It's it's Omar Gonzalez. I know, I know, on the game, the goal before that, you know, AJ Del Garza, you know, it went down, and you know, there's questions that Alan Gordon pushed him or not pushed him, but you know, Omar Gonzalez was not really, you know, he he, he, he I believe I he headed the ball, you know, toward his own net at one point there. So I think he had a hand in both in two goals there. And I mean, you're talking about a guy who's a starter on the U.S. national team, yeah. supposed to be the best or one of the best center backs in the league. And the fact is, he's just not playing like it. And they need him to be dominant because, I mean, that's for that for them to work. They need him to dominate, and that's how they won the two titles that they won. Was when he was on the field and being his dominant self. And the fact is, he just hasn't been playing at that level this year. He's been he's been having just mental breakdowns. Um, and I talked to him about it actually uh, when he was with the U.S. team in June, and he said, you know. It, it, he, one theory he had on it was that maybe he's overthinking things now. He's not just like being instinctual, and, and you know maybe he's thinking too much. That's exactly what he said. So, so there is something going on there. And, and until he gets this out of his system, the Galaxy are going to struggle because uh, they they just don't have uh, the uh, the rest of that defense needs him. They lean on him, and, and if he's shaky. Then they're going to be they're just going to be in trouble, and that's what we've seen these last few weeks. One of the more one of the other exciting games of an exciting slate of games this past weekend in MLS was Impact versus Rapids. 
Um, and I watched, you know, I watched it on direct kick, so I got the uh, the Colorado feed. So uh, I, I heard Marcello Barboa constantly reference that Montreal's defense uh, is not good. Montreal's defense is not good. And I kept thinking to myself, these guys were locked down for the first couple of months of the season. They've been shaky since then. Um, is this a red flag now for the uh, for the for the Eastern Conference leaders? You know, it was funny that you mentioned that because I, I did hear that. I hear those comments, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, Montreal for most of the years had one of the tougher defenses yeah. around, and so that was a little surprising to me. I, 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 I don't, I don't know what it is, and and it, maybe it's because the nightlife in Montreal is so good <laughs> that when they get a bye week, they just go crazy. But the last two bye, they've they've had two bye weeks in the past month, and they've come off both of those bye weeks and laid eggs. I mean, they and it's, and against teams they're supposed to beat, right? They 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 played Columbus after a bye week, a Columbus team that just lost Eddie Gavin, had lost Glauber to torn ACLs. Yeah. They, they should have just wiped the floor with them, and they lost and they got and and they beat them pretty handily. Uh, the crew beat the Impact pretty handily, and then you have now again Montreal coming off a bye. They play a Colorado team that lost three straight. You figure they're going to destroy them. Uh, and no, they they come, you know they 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 let they they blow they squander leads on two occasions, give up four goals to a Rapids team that no one would consider a high octane attack, and and it, they just came out flat. So I don't know, maybe Marco Schalabam needs to figure out a different approach to bye weeks, or or or, I don't know, or put a curfew. I don't know what's going on. But, <laughs> uh, it's an older team, and I don't know, maybe it's a team that they don't want breaks, they don't want weeks off. But I think I think they're still going to be fine. I think they're. There's too much talent there. You know, if you have any questions, if I have any questions about them, it's uh, as an older team. Yeah. Do they have the depth to to make sure that they don't wear out at the end of the season? Especially when you talk about Champions League games uh, being thrown into the mix. As we've seen through the years, you know, teams that have those extra Champions League games, you know, it can wear you down. And they're a team, they're an older team. And you wonder, you know, will Shalabon be able to manage the minutes keep those guys fresh and make sure that their older players, their key players aren't burning out at the, at the worst time of the year, which is later in the season. You mentioned Colorado's poor form leading up to that match. Um, but, and I agree with you, they, they, they haven't been getting the results, but having said that, I, I still feel like Oscar Pereja has done a, a, an excellent job of putting that team with the injuries that they've had uh, and making sure that they stay competitive. And, in my opinion, if these younger players, the Dylan Powers, the Deshaun Browns, get the consistency together, uh, they pull Chris Clute out of nowhere, and and he's been really, really good for them as well. Uh, that's a team that I, I kind of have circled and I'm keeping an eye on, much like New England, where they were teams historically that fly under the radar and are considered kind of boring. They're starting to get themselves a little identity, a little personality, and they're, they're, I could see them being frisky as we get into the second half of the season. Well, I'll tell you what, they, I, they, they've done... I would say they, they've they've exceeded expectations in certain ways, and the fact that they've been able to put put up results through the year despite all these injuries is absolutely outstanding. You have to give Oscar Perry high credit. But I said it before the season that this Colorado team was a team that I would, would, would pencil in as a team to absolutely watch in 2014. And it's because of all that young talent that they have. And, and the fact is it, it's been fast-forwarded a bit, because a lot of these young guys have been thrown into the fire because of all the injuries. So now they've been, it's kind of been a sink or swim thing. And a lot of these guys have actually been able to swim. They've been able to hold their own, do well. I mean, you have a guy like Clint Irwin who comes out of just complete obscurity and, and, ha- and is playing outstanding. Not that the last game was, you know, yeah. on that level. That was probably the worst game so far as a starter. But Dylan Powers, Deshaun Brown, Shane O'Neill, Tony Cassio. I mean, they have this great group of young guys. And, and I think, uh, the, the thing with young players is, yes, they, they, they're all playing well. They're exceeding expectations. You could argue Dylan Powers is the rookie of the year so far. But they, it's tough rookie. It's tough for rookies and that many young guys to do it for a full season. I think they're going to hit a wall. Um, I, I think even with the older guys coming back off of injuries, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't see them keeping it going through to the end of the year. I think they're going to fade. Uh, but that having said that, I think next year is the year where it really hits and where it really pays off this experience that these young guys are getting. And if, if they can keep the right guys, if they can bring in the right pieces to complement those young guys, then next year, I'll tell you what, the Rapids for 2014, for me, I think that's the year where they really take off. And I look at the Rapids, uh, their, their defensive back line. I look at my hometown team, D.C. United's back line, and I think to myself, you know, 
that is where Co- Carlos Bocanegra would really make an impact uh, in in both of those back lines because in in those situations it's 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 a team that is a little bit loosey goosey defensively and could use an organizer back there and then he ends up on Chivas USA and I I look at that back line and I go well there's nothing that Carlos Bocanegra can do that will organize that back line to a point where they're going to be respectable even with Dan Kennedy so how does Carlos Bocanegra end up on Chivas USA? Well, I, all right. Number one, DC United is, is as as awful as the year's been, right? The fact is they have, I don't know, $600,000. Oh, <laughs> don't even get into that. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. You can't go pay. You can't pay Carlos Bugner. It just doesn't work that way. You can't have you can't have three center backs. That, you can't be an MLS team and have three center backs that make over $200,000. It just doesn't work that way. So from that standpoint, they're stuck with Brandon McDonald, Dejan Yakovic. They needed those guys to play well. They haven't played well. Brandon McDonald, I thought over. I thought he played really well last year. He he overachieved last year, but he's come crashing down to earth this year. So they, I mean, but again, he's one of several players who have hasn't done it for DC. Uh, with Chivas USA, yeah, he right. One guy alone is not going to come in there and turn things around. Uh, having said that, I, I don't I I don't know if his defense is that like far gone that he can't help because I think for me I think Bobby Burling has actually done pretty well. Uh, considering as, as bad as that team is, I think you put Bobby Burley next to Bocanegra, you've got the makings of a pretty decent defense. So, uh, you know, I don't think they're, they're still not going to do anything this year because unless they really, really, really uh, bring in a boatload of, of, of high level uh, reinforcements. And I mean, I, I know, I mean, I've reported it that, that you know, they're going to bring in two young Mexican forwards who are pretty highly regarded. And that should help. But I still don't think that's going to be enough to help them, like, be a playoff team this year. But, you know, I think if you're talking about maybe having someone who can be a good leader in the locker room, uh, a good veteran presence, someone who you can market, uh, Bocanegra t- takes all the boxes, you know. I mean, he he might not be fluent in Spanish. That's something I don't think people are that like people in general are that aware of, the fact that, you know, they hear the name Carlos Bocanegra <laughs> and you think, oh, this guy's got to be yeah. fluent in Spanish. And that's never really been the case. I don't know how his Spanish is now. I mean, he I, I know he was you know, learning it in Spain now that he spent the past year there. But, you know, I don't know how good Spanish is yet to this point. But, again, he's, that, that said, he's still marketable. He still has that name. He's still some you, someone you can put on a billboard. I mean, he's, you know, let's face it. If, they, if you have, like, a best-looking player in MLS, he's on the list <laughs> yes, right away, right? So you have him and Dan Kennedy. You put those two guys on the billboard, you're going to get some women probably, uh, you know, showing up at the turnstile. Uh, but on the field, he can still help. I think he can still play at a high level. Um, I think he still comes in and can be one of the better center backs in the league. And, you know, it might not help them get the playoffs this year, but I think it'll help them be a little more respectful. It's soccer by Ivis.net, and it's Ivis Galarsev. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate you taking some time to hang out and talk with us. All right, thanks for having me. show information, go to pitchpass.com.